Okay, great. I, I'm so sorry about this, but I do want to say that this is really part of the kind of inquiry that, that, that I'm working with at the moment, which is around this kind of very different levels of, of digital access that, that, that are available uh, in relation between the global north and the global south. So let's hope we don't have load shedding too, which is where um, the electricity cuts out, um, which is not planned for tonight. Anyway, so, so to come back to the kind of framing, I, I've been working with policymakers and, and developers, AI developers across the global south, and particularly the African continent, for a number of years. And this is durante varios años, y esto pivot from a really kind of critical theory, decolonial kind of critique um, in, my, in my approach to, to understanding and writing about AI to how we take these theories and these ways of approaching understanding how inequality manifests to something that can be applied by the people that are seeking to use and develop and govern AI in, in ways that hopefully are beneficial to society. And it's been a very long road and I think a very interesting one and perhaps something we can discuss a little bit more towards the end of this talk. But my kind of main point of departure is that I believe AI is drastically worsening the state of global inequality because its operations of power are effectively imperial in nature. They seek to expand exponentially, they extract and take from post-colonial people and places, and they fracture communities and processes of resistance. At the moment, I'm finalizing a book with the same title as this presentation today, and which will be published later this year with Polity Press, that's really trying to explore some of these thematics and lines of inquiry. So today I'm going to be going through some, some of the key arguments that I'm working with uh, and testing some of them out and really looking forward to, to how we respond uh, as, as, as a group uh, to this following the presentation. I think I'd like to say at the outset that given some of the high claims of the AI industry, that its best efforts are in the name of all humanity, and given the increasing evidence base of biased AI systems, particularly against women, gender minorities and people of color, it is surprising to me that so little attention has been paid to the role and potential of AI to critically worsen the state of global inequality. I don't think we're looking at the big structural picture enough. I don't think we're building an evidence base or working to build an evidence base around the relationship between AI and worsening levels of inequality. Um, and I don't think we're unpacking enough what this means for global, for our global community and, our, and societies everywhere, really. Um, so we can go to uh, the, the first slide. So in particular, uh, recent data and statistical models have predicted that the most significant impact of AI will be economic. While earlier figures pegged a contribution to the global economy, which you see here on that slide, of $15 trillion by 2030, with the rise of generative AI, these sums have swollen to over $25 trillion, as predicted by McKinsey, attained then a shorter period of time. There is a scarcity of evidence, however, that suggests that AI's economic boom will have a positive trickle-down effect for countries of the majority world. And no systematic studies are yet to examine the linkages between the enormous economic growth AI would deliver to particular privileged zones. And you can see in this map how it's concentrated in North America and in China and, and Africa in particular doesn't feature anywhere on this particular map. It's just lumped together with Africa, Oceania, and other Asian markets down on the right-hand corner. So little has been done to examine the linkages between this enormous economic growth and the worsening of extreme poverty in post-colonial contexts and sub-Saharan Africa in particular. We can turn to the next slide. So at present, we are facing rising levels of global inequality and inequality um, within as well as between countries. 
the worst the world has witnessed since the height of European colonialism at the turn of the 20th century. So I've got a quote here from the World Inequality Report of 2022, which describes how global inequalities seem to be about as great today at the peak of Western imperialism in the early 20th century. Indeed, the share of income presently captured by the poorest half of the world's people is about half what it was in 1820, before the great divergence between Western countries and their colonies. In other words, there is still a long way to go to undo the global economic inequalities inherited, inherited from the very unequal organisation of world production between the mid-19th and mid-20th centuries. So we can see here how urgent the process of decolonization really is. So what role is AI playing here in worsening these inequalities and what benefit does AI hold for the countries in which the majority of the world lives, the so-called global south? Other global agencies, as you can see in this slide here, have similarly developed statistical models for the future of our global society. Through research examining the impact of COVID-19 on extreme poverty, the World Bank forecasted that by 2030, the same time period in which the global economy will see gains of 16 trillion and now 25 trillion from AI, 90% of the world's poor will live in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, as you can see, sub-Saharan Africa will be the only region in the world where extreme poverty will increase, with the rest of the world set to experience significant drops in those numbers. Where AI differs from earlier technologies is in its capacity to self-learn. The defining feature of AI, of course, and the technologies of the so-called fourth industrial revolution is that their rate of development and adoption is exponential. AI will simply teach itself to be better and more efficient. It is optimized to continuously self-improve. But critically, this means that if AI is not redirected to addressing global inequality and is left to bring increasing wealth and prosperity to high-income countries, the global inequality gap is simply going to widen at an exponential rate as we race into a fundamentally divided future. That the benefits of AI are not evenly distributed is increasingly being recognised. However, the policy response to this is firmly that efforts are needed to support those that are being left behind to catch up. This kind of narrative is an easy extension of the idol uh, idolization of AI that has arisen in recent years, a position that assumes that AI will, even if it is not yet, produce positive net benefits for humanity writ large and represents the pinnacle of enlightened applied scientific discovery and human reason. Within this framing, the only goal is to advance AI further and distribute AI more widely. It allows very little room to ask, do we want AI to play such a dominant role in our societies? And is AI really benefiting us all? As AI serves to accelerate prosperity and well-being in those places where it is produced and readily incorporated into social and economic life, for everywhere and everyone else, it is not helping to manifest and improve lives. Within this tangled tapestry, what becomes clear is that the uneven distribution of AI's benefits, those who are benefiting are benefiting because others are being used and harmed in order to produce AI and sustain its relevance and reliability. And those who are being exploited and oppressed in the production and use of AI are the very same people who have historically been exploited and oppressed by global power, that is women, people of color and citizens of the majority world. In my work, I engage with perspectives and accounts from the majority world, and I examine some of the key tendencies and trends of the industry from within a historical frame. This historical frame allows us to understand the social, political, and economic conditions that give rise to an unequal world, a history that is profoundly connected to the history of European colonialism and the seizure of land and resources from places across Africa, Asia, and the Americas. In understanding how global inequality came to manifest within the history of modernity and capitalism, which began in earnest in, 19, in 1492, with the arrival of Christopher Columbus on the coast of the New World of the Americas, we can begin to identify the structural relationships between and find expression for 
the ways in which old forms of power continue their work of what Annabel Quigiano calls de-equalization. So in this talk today, I'm going to be focusing on, on three four statements. The first is that the majority world is paying the price for AI. The second is that the cost of AI is leaving behind the majority world, driving this production of an elitist technology. And AI is impacting on labor inequality and the global division of labor. <laughs> so those are, that's the particular um, segment of this kind of question of global inequality that I'm looking at. So the AI value chain, all the pieces and the production and all the systems of transportation and human labor that go into the production of AI technologies depends heavily on the extraction of resources and labor from the majority world. Right from the beginning of the creation of the hardware upon which AI systems are built with the extraction of rare earth minerals from the war-torn zones of the Democratic Republic of Congo to the salt plains of the Atacama Desert, lying in the north of Peru in the eastern boundaries of Bolivia and Argentina, AI depends on the lands and resources of places which barely benefit from this new technology. Over the past 10 years, the demand for lithium has increased by almost a thousand percent, and with it, its value. Statistics predict that with the rise in demand for AI-driven electric vehicles and other battery-powered devices such as laptops, tablets, and mobiles, the global demand for lithium will skyrocket. But mining lithium is not straightforward, especially in the arid salt plains of the Atacama Desert. Lithium is found within pools of brine suspended under the desert ground. These pools must be pumped out to the surface and then filtered through evaporation processes to extract the precious lithium. Miles long evaporation ponds, like you see on the slides in front of you, stretch out across the desert, where under the clear skies, evaporation happens quickly, refining the diluted brine into vivid technicolors of concentrated lithium. The brighter the hue of the pond, from yellows and greens to blues reflecting the desert's cloudless ceiling, the stronger the concentration of lithium. Often, contamination can, can, can occur, releasing harmful toxins from the evaporation process into the ground and groundwater. These processes of extraction rob the arid landscape of the little water it has. For many of Chile's indigenous groups, the lithium industries have affected a kind of ethnocide, forcing many to relocate or abandon their cultural traditions. In Chile, the rights of the country's indigenous population, which make up at least 2 million people of the country's 18 million, are notoriously underrecognized in the new constitution. Without rights, these groups have little claims over the water now needed for the extraction of lithium. We can move to the next slide. In the mining regions of the Democratic Republic of Congo, all sorts of social and political problems are ensuring because of the demand for the rare earth materials contained within its soils. In my book, I explore in depth the colonial history of some of the major mining companies still operating in the DRC today. One of the most concerning problems is that children are being recruited in the scramble for cobalt and rare earth materials needed to power smartphones, computers and more. Their small bodies exploited to crawl into narrow mine shafts and pick through unearthed rubble. A significant complaint of human rights abuse was lodged by an international human rights group at a federal court in Washington, D.C. In 2019, against some of the major buyers of cobalt, including Tesla, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft, the complaint was made on behalf of the families of children working in cobalt mines in the DRC who had died or suffered lifelong injuries as a result of their perilous work. In 2021, the case was dismissed, with the judge determining that there was insufficient evidence to tie the incidents to the companies named. While this confirms the urgency of attaining evidence to untangle the knotty links of the global supply chains of AI and advanced digital technologies, it is also revealing of a system of justice that is skewed towards power and privilege. We can move to the next slide. Increasingly too, we are recognizing that the environmental impacts of AI are enormous. What is less evident is who pays the price for the environmental damage the AI industry is causing. 
turning from the very beginnings of the material production of AI to the very end, I'm going to look at this specifically in relation to e-wastage and the end of the AI value chain. Part of Accra, adjacent to the Adal River that flows through the Coral Lagoon into the Atlantic Ocean, is an area called Agbog Bloshi. It is home to one of the largest e sites of e-wastage. Every year, hundreds of thousands of tons of defunct electrical goods, smart devices and technologies made obsolete by the rapidly developing tech industry, arrive from Europe, the US, Australia and other wealthier nations at the port town of Tema, an hour outside of Accra. A UN report estimates that, five, that 50 million tons of e-waste is produced each year an amount that is steadily increasing with new smart devices entering the mass market and the technologies of yesterday outdated by newer and faster models. Much of this is dumped in Agbog Bloshi. The global production of e-waste mirrors the contours of economic privilege. The average amount of e-waste produced in the global north is around 20 kilograms per person, while on the African continent, where much of the e-waste ends up, it is estimated to be less than 2 kilograms per person per year. Over 100,000 people live in the electric wasteland of Agbogloshi. Many have migrated from the north of the country in search of work and opportunities in the burgeoning city. Those residing in Agbogloshi seek out a living, sifting through scraps of electrical hardware and wires, plastic casing and circuit boards, looking for traces of metals such as copper and aluminium embedded inside and that can be sold on. The work of dismantling the West's old electronics and reclaiming the metals which, as we will see, have oftentimes been mined from the soil of their own continent is physically gruelling and dangerous. In the rummage for scraps of value in the electrical rubbish, those at work are exposed to countless harmful toxins. These toxins poison the groundwater of Agbogloshi and the Odor River, carrying carcinogenics and other harmful substances to nearby communities and farmlands, affecting a far greater number of people, people through contamination of crops and water supplies while above a heavy black cloud broods in the relentless heat, producing from the burning electrical cables and polluting the skies of Accra. The living conditions for families residing in Agbogloshi are dire. In the slums that have been erected, chickens and other livestock kick about through broken smartphones and the carcasses of old refrigerators. A study determined that the chicken eggs of Agbogloshi had the highest rate of hazardous brominated and chlorinated dioxins ever found in free range eggs. These toxic eggs may be all the families living within the area have available to eat, with critical consequences for pregnant women and the health of children and Ghana's future generations. The air pollution and groundwater contagion also caused by the daily dumping and salvaging taking place in Agbogloshi. The area constitutes a major health risk and environmental concern for the residents of Accra. In, tech side. in stark contrast, The top brands built and developed enormous economic benefits are being reached from this burgeoning industry. A class, a class of tech billionaires sits at the top, equipped with the power, money and influence to craft the worlds they want to live in. In conversations in Davos or in moments when new breakthroughs give rise to new imaginative glories, AI may be spoken of as a gift that all humanity can enjoy and benefit. Rachel, I believe you're frozen up again.
I believe uh, Rachel's internet has cut out. Um, so hopefully she'll be able to uh, join via a hotspot on her phone um, in just a moment. So please hold. Thanks Sorry. for your patience, I, everyone. I, hi, Kate. I, I, I think it's back on. If you can hear me, okay. You're yes, back. we can hear you. Great. I'm sorry about this. I will, I will continue. No um, worries. Thank you. So I was saying because of this and because of the exclusion inherent in the production of AI and in the system of returns for which only a select few benefit in stratospheric proportions, AI is not at present an opportunity available for all of humanity to thrive from. It is costly to develop and its production its productive use does not, perhaps not just yet, extend to the largely agrarian and informal economies across much of Africa in particular. Indeed, the McKinsey report, which sought to set out the economic trajectory for new generative AI models, indicates that the sectors most likely to see the most economic growth are the high-tech industries, such as big tech, space exploration, defense, as well as banking and retail. Whereas the industry likely to see the least growth is agriculture, Africa's largest sector by a long way. Without a high level of saturation across all industries, AI's economic benefits here as anywhere will be minimal. But even so, the cost of building AI is highly exclusionary. Quite simply, these capabilities and industries could not have been developed anywhere outside of the West or the advanced economies of the Far East. The audacity of the sheer scale of what generative AI encompasses cannot be overstated. Besides funding and commercial value, equivalent to the GDP of some of the world's poorest countries, OpenAI receives the $10 billion investment from Microsoft and was developed from a $1 billion tech from some of the Silicon Valley's heavyweights. The acquisition of tech talent that reportedly costs as much as professional sports players Generative AI like ChatGPT is conceived out of a daring imagination, able to regard the entire archives of the internet as a reserve to be raided. While to do this work, to access and manipulate the global information of the internet requires power and resources beyond measure. Creating an AI system like ChatGPT demands a range of compute resources that can process trillions of language-based data points from the internet with which to train their artificial neural networks. These resources include the semiconductor computer chips needed in the thousands for the general processing units, the nucleus of AI-driven computing systems processing thousands of small tasks at once the software and computer code or language such as Python that instructs the processing undertaken by general processing units and manages the vast repository of data. And finally, the hardware infrastructure in which these activities are powered and contained from the data centers containing thousands of high powered server units and the equipment needed to cool them to the undersea cables that transfer data around the world. To power the development of ChatGPT requires a supercomputer. Microsoft invested one billion in its first supercomputer for OpenAI to train its AI models on, ultimately resulting in breakthroughs like ChatGPT. Large language models reportedly require around a hundred times more computer processing power due to the enormity of data they are trained on and the complexity of their neural networks. In computing power alone, ChatGPT would have cost around $100 million to train. These kinds of computers are currently only available in a small handful of countries around the world, including the US and Canada. Even the UK does not have supercomputers that rival this scale, although Rishi Sunak has announced plans to spend an eye water in $1.1 billion to build a British supercomputer. For Vilay Lidon Vitra, a professor at Oxford University, who has written on the material infrastructure of cloud computing, uh, this is what is behind the AI race. And without the requisite computing infrastructure, the UK would not be able to catch up. Deftly named the cloud 
that is to suggest a weightless and immaterial expanse. The cloud is not a singular place where data and software is housed, but instead refers to internet run servers, software and databases enclosed in data centers, oftentimes located in remote rural settings. Lidon Vritra states that on a geopolitical level, the UK may lack the autonomy to steer the development of frontier AI in a manner aligned with its values and objectives. This is because without its own advanced computer infrastructure, UK AI firms will need to rely on renting compute power through the cloud computing services offered by the major tech companies. Currently, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure and Google Cloud together make up 65% of the global market share of cloud computing, maintaining a lucrative market position that is near to impossible to compete with. As more and more pressure is put on industries and governments to adopt AI, and as it becomes harder and harder not to participate in the global systems of data and the internet in which AI is now inextricably implicated, the monopolistic power of cloud computing companies to rent seek from just about everyone simply snowballs. But we can move uh, to the next slide. Between them, the regions of the so-called global south hold less than 3% of global compute capacity. Africa, home to almost 1.5 billion people, has only 0.2%. At present, with the kind of compute capacity available in Africa, South America, or Oceania, it would take hundreds of years to catch up with the kinds of advances that have been made with large language models in the West and developed East. If the UK government's recent commitment to spend over a billion dollars to secure a national exascale computer is indicative of the kind of funded required to meet the levels of compute capacity needed to compete in the global AI race a sum equivalent to the national GDP of a number of the world's poorest countries, then huge scores of Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and many small island states are almost completely excluded from ever being able to catch up and take advantage of this technology in their own terms. The only le path left is to rent computing services and data from the cloud computing clients and feed the monopoly. If we are to believe Elon Musk, which I suggest we don't, then we are moving towards a world of abundance where minimal wage will be replaced by universal high income. Yet across the majority world, many thousands of people are being recruited into unfair and unprotected digital labour schemes of, or platform and gig work, which is where I turn to next. Just as the race through the bottom prompted multinational corporations to seek out cheap labour in poorer countries across the global south, the labour demands of AI are being shored off to out of reach places where the supply chain back to Silicon Valley AI developers is harder to trace and the little commitment and little commitment or investment is expected. It is an industry that is kept abstract, informal and unconnected from the larger AI ecosystem. In contrast to high income earning data scientists in Silicon Valley, the labor force required to do the tedious work of building AI models toils in unseen places, plunged into regimes of work that cannot sustain a decent standard of living and trapped in cycles of overwork, debt and varying degrees of maltreatment and harm. We can turn to the, to the next slide. In recent years, the painstaking human labour involved in the production and maintenance of AI systems has been brought to light. Stories reported in mainstream media have revealed the massive human labour force that has quietly arisen in hidden places around the world, tasked with the painstaking labour of building and rebuilding the digital archives and data vaults by AI. Any user will be familiar with the simple exercise whereby entry to a web page requires proving I am not a robot by identifying, for instance, a series of pictures of motorbikes. Imagine spending 12 hours a day or more for months on end completing such activities. This is precisely the kind of work that is involved in the data maintenance needed to build and then boost the accuracy and efficacy of AI systems. This work is not easy, it is exacting, yet mind-numbing and thankless work, more so given the wider set of problems that surround current labour practices in this space, the kind of pay that is being offered to those involved in sorting and labelling of data for AI in the South is both way below a living wage and far less 
then what a pet company would need to pay workers in their home country to do the same job. It can also often involve viewing thousands of violent and disturbing online images and videos and removing them from mainstream social media platforms, as has been recently reported. Where we have seen too how new jobs are arising across the majority world, including in Africa, is through platform economies like Uber, Bolt, or, or Sweep South, a platform here in South Africa for domestic work. These platforms, however, effectively work to rationalize the informal economy, extracting value from their workers who are given little to no job security or labor protection. Without formalized protections or collective bargaining power, the new job opportunities created through platform economies are unlikely to provide people with a route out of poverty. There are a number of issues here. First, the concern that AI will displace jobs. As a field, one of the critical drivers behind the advancement of AI technology is, of course, to enhance economic productivity and reduce the number of expensive and unpredictable humans involved in supply chains. Where this means turning away from the cheap labour that the that the global south offers following global and following globalization to freely available ai driven labor this will of course have major implications for southern labor market especially where workers cannot easily reskill second however the position statements coming from the likes of the international labor organization and oecd is that ai will create new jobs yet this is not so straightforward on the continent where the majority of people and the continent like Africa, where the majority of people earn a living within the informal economy and are not formally employed as such. For such people, we are less interested in how many new jobs AI will create than we are in how AI will change people's access to decent and dignified wage opportunities. In closing, I'd like to talk briefly to some of the practical strategies we need to be thinking about to address some of the extreme power asymmetries I've been describing. While AI, has a AI ethics has a dominant place in conversations around how AI is to be safeguarded, it is pretty hollow outside of independent institutions and governments' processes that enforce the implementation of ethical values in practice. Without these, ensuring AI is ethical is left in the hands of the very people and organisations who are causing harm. In addition, while legislation protecting the enjoyment of human rights from AI-driven harms and risks is significant and will provide an important mechanism for holding users and developers of AI to account. Such laws will not address the full ambit of structural iniquities and harms that AI is causing and contributing to. Instead, a complementary regime of laws and policies will be required, covering not just the first order effects of AI and AI systems like AI bias, but the wider social, political and economic ones. Essentially, this would include reviewing and extending antitrust and foreign investment laws to better protect against market oligopolies and ensure fair technology transfers which build capacities in local regions and uphold the well-being of local communities. It would also include ensuring intellectual property laws protect local creators who, whose content may be appropriated by AI systems. What would also be important is in facilitating accountability through the value and supply chains of AI. Technology companies should be compelled to understand and take accountability for the full extent of their value chains. What we need to work towards is something akin to restorative economics, where people involved along AI supply and value chains are provided dignified opportunities to earn a decent living wage. This would mean that companies using cobalt for the DRC or lithium from the Atacama Desert contribute to ensuring that the mining and extraction of those regions is done in accordance with local value systems and customs, and that international standards for workplace health and safety are upheld. As the AI industry expands, protecting the rights of labourers involved in digital labour, micro work, and in platform and gig economy will, of course, be a crucial touchstone in ensuring AI does not severely worsen global inequality. Not only will these labour forces expand, requiring labour relation laws and whistleblowing laws to expand to provide full labour protections for these people, but these groups hold the potential to be a formidable counterpower to the oppressive and imperial power of AI. 
unions for digital laborers and those working in platform industries should be established to help coordinate the much needed bargaining power which laborers together can wield over big tech. Structures for the collective bargaining like trade unions will also create spaces for platform and digital workers who are often isolated from their peers to come together and build solidarity around key issues they may face. Across the world, if informal and grassroots unions are arising within these industries, but where a state can legitimise this through law and workers' rights, these mechanisms can be more influential. Beyond lawmaking to eradicate the harms AI causes and hold power to account, governments and governance more generally can and should play a role in redistributing the benefits of AI. In fact, governments have a major role to play. We cannot leave this critical mission up to market forces alone. There are a number of policy interventions being enacted or considered that seek to better level the playing field when it comes to AI. These include programs for enhancing AI skills, whether among school children or workers whose jobs may be at risk. It also includes developing data comments and mechanisms for sharing data or providing access to data for smaller companies. While the open movement, including open source coding, open data and open access LLMs is important, it is not enough. One of the central lessons in the history of technology diffusion is that the benefits of new technologies are not realized when a technology is made accessible, but when it is used. This also crucially means that AI has to be locally useful. An example here might be developing natural language processing technologies in local languages and that work on voice input and output, something that would be far more useful for populations with low literacy. On the one hand, this will require governments investing in creating the conditions for local innovators to develop AI applications that address local needs and ensuring their proper safeguarding. But on the other hand, a larger scale effort may be required to push big tech to develop AI technologies and capabilities with a universal design in mind. Indeed, establishing equitable partnerships between different groups and stakeholders will be an important part of creating the paradigm shift needed to change the global trajectory of AI, bridging the wide gap between the elitist AI companies at the forefront of AI development and governments and innovators from far less privileged parts of the world will be essential if AI is to be transformative for all of humanity. Thank you.